we would repeat with Karl Everhardt. Karl is a professor of neuro urology, so he is a urologist in the interdisciplinary staff. He's head of clinics in the Ghent University in Belgium, and he's specialist and active member and and researcher of Nocturia and one of the few people in the world who really looks deep into pathophysiology of Nocturia. So please uh, listen carefully and you have the once in life opportunity to ask everything what you should know about the pathophysiology. Karo. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I would like to focus on nocturnal polyuria and its implications. And just to keep flow of the story, I would like to start with uh, a little bit of physiopathology, as I believe that at least urologists and gynecologists among you might lack a little information to follow the story. So we can say that um, in general we have in the dynamics of urine production three different uh, mechanisms that have an impact on the amount of urine that we are actually voiding uh, on 24 hours. And the first is the glomerulus, where we have glomerular filtration, which is actually regulated by renal perfusion. Second, we have osmotic diuresis, which is mainly determined by sodium, and which is regulated by the atrial natriuretic peptide and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And at last, in the collecting duct, and in the last part of the loop of Henley, there is the main place where we reabsorb huge quantities of water so that we can go down from 180 liters to one liter and a half. And this is called, what is rest is uh, water diuresis, which is regulated by vasopressin. So when we focus a little bit for the sake of this talk to osmotic diuresis, then I would first like to explain you the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is the sympathetic innervation of our kidney. So in situations where we lose pressure or blood and volume, we will increase the RAS system and that will cause sodium and water reabsorption. But for the sake of the talk, I would like to, to, to explain the situation when the intravascular volume of pressure is rising. And in that case, you will see increase in renal perfusion. You will have elevation of the atrial natriuretic peptide and you will lose, you will secrete sodium and with that water and you will depress the RAS system. Again, you will have less reabsorption of it. So the result will be diuresis, glomerular filtration, and osmotic diuresis. We all know that uh, obese people, people rather have polyuria. But that's what we clinicians do with it. That's where it stops for most of us. However, I would like you to understand that obesity is resulting very quickly on in its, uh, in its disease state, let's say, in an increase in renal plasma flow, in an increase in glomerular pressure, in an increase in filtration fraction, and as such, in a net afferent dilatation. The result of this is albumin excretion and glomerulosclerotic damage. And this phenomenon is seen uh, very early on before the development of diabetes. So when we do see patients with rather with onset of nocturia, we should think also about polyuria and perhaps the onset of a metabolic syndrome. Good, let's go a bit further. How does this come? Well, first of all, we know from the literature that obesity results in activation of the RAS system. We will reabsorb uh, water and sodium. We will therefore get volume expansion and hypertension. 
And also when the fat is compressing the kidney in the loop of Henle, the pressure in the loop of Henle will raise, and due to this, you will get more water and salt reabsorption with volume expansion and hypertension as a consequence. And the net result of both mechanisms is that the glomerulus will need, will perform compensatory hyperfiltration to compensate for all the reabsorption of the water and the sodium. This second uh, phase of nocturnal polyuria I would like to discuss with you is incontinence in elderly. And Sophie did a study in 55 elderly, and we did uh, micturition diaries and incontinence diaries, and almost all of our patients had nocturnal polyuria. A bit less of half of them had nocturia, and a bit more than half of them had urinary incontinence at night. And we noticed uh, on statistics analysis that the nocturnal voided volume, when this went above 625 ml, that there was a risk factor for the use of incontinence material, suggesting the overdistension of the bladder beyond this point will lead rather to incontinence than to nocturia. Following um, phase of nocturnal polyuria is retention. And this, for this, we did a second study with 37 patients. And we not only noted micturition and incontinence, but also we did bladder scans and measured residual urine. And as you will see, um, 15 out of the 37 had nocturia more than two. And we had patients with up to five nocturia episodes. When we further analyzed, we saw that we had 11% of our patients with residuals above 200 ml. And their bladder capacities were larger at night compared to the day. And the residual capacity ratio during the night was much higher than the, the residual urine capacity ratio during the day, again, suggestion of overdistension of the bladder during the night. The last picture I would like to share with you is nocturnal polyuria in neurogenic patients. When we present our results on these neurogenic patients, there is always somebody asking the question, is this relevant? Is this important? Well, I will try to convince that to you that this is very important. This low paraplegic man has a low pressure bladder and his bladder is full in the morning and you can see that he has dilated kidneys and ureters. And after emptying his low pressure bladder, he has perfectly normal kidneys and ureters. Don't tell me that if every night you blow up your kidneys, that this can be very healthy. Second case is a quadriplegic young patient with uh, severe bladder hyperreflexia. He had an augmentation. He performed self-catheterizations, and he achieved a bladder of about 800 ml. But nevertheless, during the night, due to his nocturnal polyuria, he had autonomic dysreflexia, which is a life-threatening disease, and he had disturbing nocturnal leakage. And as he was young and he had a partner, this was a huge loss of quality of life. We were able to treat him successfully with desmopressin melt. Maria Street has just shown in the presentation in the poster session on the other side, and we had more or less the same uh, presentation on the EAU conference. And here you can see a control population without nocturnal polyuria. You can see a control population with nocturnal polyuria but no spinal cord injury, and the red line are the spinal cord patients with nocturnal polyuria. And you see that early on in the night, they have an increase in urine production. We were interested to realize what was happening, and you can see that the spinal cord patients did have a peak in creatinine clearance, which is nothing more than something like hyperfiltration which we discussed earlier on in our obese patients. When we then go on to the 
nocturnal polyuria patients without spinal cord injury, you can see that they had a peak in free water clearance, which is nothing else than a disturbance of the vasopressin mechanism, which is a completely different mechanism of action than we can see in a spinal cord injured patient. And both groups had an increase in sodium excretion during the night, which is another mechanism which explains the nocturnal polyuria. I thank you for your attention. So, Carol, thank you. So again, first the audience, if you have any questions, please complete your question in the, on the question card or come to the microphone. Please introduce yourself again. We are electronically recording this so we know where the question comes from. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Pallavi Lathe. I work as a urogynecologist in Birmingham in the UK. The question is, do you know of any studies which have looked at uh, salt-free diets and effect on nocturnal polyuria? Does it help? Yes, we are actually performing a study on salt restriction diets. But I think this is too early to say anything. I can't, but the study is ongoing. Thank you. We actually believe that there is a certain group of salt losers which we might be able to help with salt restriction. So it's worth exploring. Uh, I've got, no, please, please go ahead. Um, Dilesh Panika from Queen Square. Um, I have a quite a few patients with nocturnal polyuria in which obesity is quite a significant factor. And many of these patients have sleep studies and we, we can't really identify a cause. So my question really is in your practice, how often um, do you tell a patient that I think it's your morbid obesity that's the cause for the nocturnal polyuria? Um, and the second what I want to know is um, in the setting of a metabolic syndrome with endothelial dysfunction, where we know there's uh, alterations in the mm -hmm. renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, do you think that's a link between um, the metabolic syndrome and nocturnal polyuria? Um, I think I will start with the first uh, question on um, um, the obesity and how frequently we know we notice this. Well, we see now and then polyuric patients, and I must say that uh, quite often these were polydipsia patients. And I think in the last 20 years, I have sent huge amounts of these patients to the endocrinologists, but actually never something came out of it. However, it's only for six months, myself, by just playing around with the data and, and, and the literature, that I do realize that I'm sure that we do miss a huge opportunity in finding patients which should be referred to the internal medicine department, rather than giving them other treatments. And about the renin angiotensin and, uh, the, and endothelial dysfunction, I think that might be the... Well, that's the sympathetic uh, innervation who is activated, so when you activate the, the sympathetic nerves, you will get erectile dysfunction and you seem to also find uh, an important polyuria effect. Carl, I've got one question. You told us that obese men or women have um, increased non nocturnal urine production. Does this correlate with nocturia as well, or is it just no. more production, it stays in the bladder, it doesn't matter, or is it associated with nocturia? It's associated with polyuria. Right, but it's not Not nocturia. specifically with nocturnal polyuria. Right. And do you think it's a valid mechanism of action when we recommend, recommend weight reduction? Is it a behavioral treatment? I think we should think of that, but here again, uh, I think I read one study on weight loss and, and uh, nocturia, but I think we, we need to do studies on this. So what do you think we should tackle first? Should we increase bladder capacity or decrease nocturnal urine production? Or should we combine it? 
Uh, it's clear that you have three types of patients. You have those with a small bladder and a normal nocturnal urine production. You have those with a normal bladder and nocturnal polyuria. And you have a mixed group. And I think you first have to diagnose these three groups and then select for the most logic treatment first. And for the diagnosis, you're using frequency volume charts? We use frequency volume charts as a first step. And when we define nocturnal polyuria, we do renal function profiles to see why they have nocturnal polyuria, if it's glomerular filtration, osmotic diuresis, or water diuresis. So what you're actually doing, you are evaluating urine sodium concentration in, in, in the patients. Creatinine, yeah. sodium, and water, osmolality. All right, perfect. Does the audience have any further questions? If it's not the case, Carlos, thank you very much.